great topic for Kodak to sponsor. It's a real pleasure that we're here, and it's an honor to uh, introduce this panel. I have a quick question for the audience. Um, I want, I'm interested to know how many of you guys have heard of Kodak? I know it's a silly question. Thank you, I'm glad that it was a silly question. Now, how many of you guys in your day-to-day -day lives, when you're home, you're on vacation, how many of you bring a film camera with you? And I think that illustrates why this conversation is so relevant to Kodak. Uh, Kodak, over the past five, 10 years, has undergone a huge brand transformation. And today, you might be surprised to, to learn that 70% of our business is actually B2B. And hopefully, most of you are Kodak customers on the B2B side and use our entertainment imaging films in your commercial production. But that just gives you an idea of the huge transformation that we've undergone and why we're so happy to, uh, to be kicking off this, uh, this panel. So uh, that's it for me. I just wanted to, to thank you for having us. And uh, please join me now in welcoming Mike Chapman, editor of Adweek. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, welcome to the, uh, the latter half of Advertising Week, everybody. Um, and also uh, welcome to the uh, tail end of the economic meltdown that has uh, wrought so much misery. Uh, that is, unless you believe uh, what uh, was written in the Wall Street Journal on Monday, um, um, because that seemed to imply that uh, in the advertising industry, we've got quite a few more months to go of uh, misery before we're uh, wading through the green shoots. Um, perhaps we'll uh, kick the discussion off on that. But uh, first to the panel, um, and uh, congratulations to, to Matt and the organizers of Advertising Week. We have an incredible panel uh, for you today. It certainly is the top brass. Um, and why don't uh, you guys come on stage now, and I'll uh, perhaps introduce you as you walk up. So we have Marita Scarfi from Organic, Larry Woodard from Vigilante, Matt Seeler from Universal McCann, Richard Pinder from Publicis, and Tom Carroll from TBWA. Am I on? Great. Like Star Trek. So we'll probably, uh, we've uh, got 45 minutes and, uh, and five panelists, so I was going to ask everyone to keep their answers to 140 characters or less. <laughs> that's okay. That's the way we all write and read now anyway. All right, maybe 140 words or less. How's that? Can we, we manage that? So I thought we'd start off a uh, very, very high level. Um, this is one that uh, maybe everyone will want to comment on, but um, I'll start with you, Marita. Um, without debating how many... How many more months we have of, of this meltdown before things are picking up and the green shoots are all around us. When the, the, at least we know now there is an end of the tunnel. When we emerge from it, what in your mind will have changed forever? Um, well, I think the landscape that will change forever is pretty much that the marketing, the way in which marketing is done today obviously is uh, evolving. It'll continue to evolve. Um, there's in my mind, a lot, everybody's mind, a lot of shift to digital and what that really means. Um, and overall, I think the uh, budgets uh, might not come back to the levels that we had previously. So um, there's going to be a kind of a relook and on marketing overall within marketing organizations and how they're structured, and um, and then just within the agency structures as well too. We'll get we'll get to some perhaps some more of that internal stuff in a minute. Larry, what do you think? What's changed forever? It'll never be the same again. And, and I love the question, by the way. <laughs> uh, the fact is everything, uh, you know, everything and nothing. Uh, if you look at uh, the Great Depression, which seems to be the only thing we can compare this to at, at this point in the game, um, radio became dominant. You know, uh, people were home more, and uh, the entertainment that they could afford was radio, and radio became preeminent. The soap opera came out of radio. Uh, and the world was changed forever. Uh, in this way, even looking at this audience, um, you know, you're all people, but I see you as little broadcasting centers, little satellite dishes on your head, because media now is the individual. And uh, so our job uh, heretofore was entertaining you and making you watch our commercials, and now it's going to be giving you what you want, because if you don't want it, we won't be able to serve it to you. And I think that's the big thing that's, that's changing. 
things like that. I don't think anything ever changes permanently. Like, you know, I think that we think that it's a cataclysmic event and we're never going to be the same, and then we are. And we think we're never going to buy anything and it's only going to be promotions that drive everything and then we start buying stuff again. So I think that we will have shifted around a little bit. I remember post 9-11 post being with a brilliant guy who was asking that question of, you know, now things will have changed forever. Like there will never be another hijacking. Well, then it just switched to pirating. You know, it, there's a different kind of hijacking. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sure, we have changed media mixes and we have ended up doing more geo-targeting and we've done smarter things because of what's going on, but we'll drift back into entertaining people into buying stuff. Interesting. Um, and, I mean, without getting too macro about it, will, do, you, do you think the U.S. economy is going to continue to be one that's driven by, US, by, by consumer spending like it was before? That's going to come back? I do. I think that, I've said this before, but I think that we are a, a nation of poor dieters, that we diet all the time and we think that we're really going to make it work this time. And then after a couple of months, we kind of begin eating again. Right. And we have tried this not spending money thing for a while, but we really like shopping. So we're <laughs> going to spend money again. We're just going to be conservative for a little while and then open it back up. Okay, so I mean, perhaps nothing changes forever. But Tom, I mean, are there the things that you were doing at um, TBWA before that you will never do again? No, I mean, I agree with Matt. I don't think all the crash crisis did was exacerbate what should have been going on mm -hmm. anyways. It's not like the crisis hit and all of a sudden digital became a big issue. Digital was a big issue before the crisis. So all the crisis did was exacerbate people moving faster to change things. But none of that, uh, we're still, we, if the crisis hadn't happened, we'd still be a industry totally in upheaval without the right. crisis. I mean, we still don't know what's going on. We still don't know where, what the mix is going to be. We still don't know what role digital is going to play, how dramatic it's going to be. Are people going to get bored with uh, being in front of a terminal all the time, reading stupid blogs and you know, from yes. people they don't know who they are? Or are they going to go back to, you know, there'll be a balance, but I don't think anything's really changed. I think if you weren't changing before the crisis, you're dead anyway. Right. Nice. Richard, yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I think that's the debate. I mean, for me, I don't, I'm not clever enough to know what's going to change forever because forever is a real long time. But um, <laughs> what I'm aware of is East-West, consumer producer and analog digital. East-West uh, was in Singapore last week. Um, the place is on fire. I mean, just going like this, China, 10% growth already back predicted next year for the advertising industry. Yeah. You know, you won't see that in Western Europe or the US. Analog, digital, we know the story. No. We're already 15% digital, hope to be 30 within two years. That isn't something we would say a few years ago. So right. clearly something has changed, but as right. uh, these guys have said, it started. Yeah. And the consumer producer piece is pretty clear to me, which is that we no longer will be producing things without caring how people will interact now. If right. we ever did, that was pretty tough, right. but we could get away with it, now we can't. And what, um, and anyone can tell us, what, what what does all this mean, if anything, for the structure of advertising agencies and the way they work, just mm -hmm. to focus internally? Mm -hmm. um, as um, when we've touched on, it might have accelerated changes that were already ongoing, but um, are, there, are there any sort of structural changes, the way agencies work, the way they relate to clients? Um, A lot less people. That, that uh, yeah, that are going to result. Mm, I think a lot less people. I mean, we're obviously going to have to make yeah, things work. The jobs yeah. not coming back. Absolutely, productivity, driving, uh, people driving uh, much more greater efficiency, but you see that in Asia anyway. The speed, the lack of people to service each piece, the real drive of that. I think clients, a bit like they do in the US around the rest of the world now, will want less people per job, but cleverer people. You think that's something we're going to import? I think, no, I think you guys are already running with people more focused, maybe not less people, right. but more focused. Uh, the rest of the world was running this diverse strategy, which I think is uh, going to mm. change. I think there's a lot of that sort of stuff's going to go on. Right. I, I think the biggest impact has been on how you define creative. And I think the biggest shift is in the creative departments and what, what is creative when you throw digital. We, you see digital and people think it's all about data and it's all about tech, techies. And it's really, that's a creative issue. You know, clients look and they say, well, I want to be more digital. I want to be more digital. I want to save money more, you know, earned. I want more, you know, I want to take all those efficiencies of a digital world. Okay, great. As your media costs go down, your creative costs go up. Yep. And as your creative costs go up, you still have to pay 
Creative people are expensive. They're more expensive than really good creative people. They're extremely expensive. It's how you think about what creative is and how you recalibrate your creative departments and how you recalibrate what the thing we sell most, which is insight and creativity. That's what we sell. That's why people come to us. Because if they didn't, if they didn't need insight and creativity, they could do it themselves. You can hire all the other stuff that goes on in terms of how you do marketing. It's creativity and the smart people who trigger in creativity, planners and uh, smart marketing people and brand people that you have around. So it's just, it's, we're still a creative industry. We're not a tech industry. Tech drives part of it, but it's about creativity. And that's the change is how we think about what is our creative product and how do we sell it. Right. Matt, have you got any thoughts Did on Do those words fit on the allotted piece of paper? <laughs> yeah, a lot definitely. of words. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I I'm double think, uh, you know, creative agency was the question. <laughs> I'm not. Running. I'm like, oh, what's his name? Like Gaddafi. Gaddafi had 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We got another yeah, hour of right. you. That's right. I have the, the word too. rent springs to mind quite quickly. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so you know, creative agency, agency, whatever. I think that what hopefully will come of this, and in a way, I think that the economy hasn't gotten bad enough, is we all still look and feel an awful lot like each other. And I wish that creative agencies weren't so much like each other with the same departments within, so that when a client is looking for a new agency solution, they can't just sort of go pick from A, B, C, or D. You know, the people within and the work that gets done is different, but the ways in which we're all structured is just too much alike. So I love the new models that should come from crappy economies like this that are merging entities together that, you know, a retail plus a media, a direct plus a traditional, a digital plus a, um, a mass. You know, start changing up the structures a bit so that um, we don't look and feel the same. Right. That's what I hope comes of this. Yeah, I think that, that we're really changing. We need to change in, in some fundamental ways that we're not changing quickly enough mm. in. And, uh, and that's going to bring about a more radical change in advertising than we actually want. I mean, what we want to believe is that people have to buy, have to come to creative people to get creative ideas. But might I remind you of what happened uh, during typesetting? I remember getting into the industry and spending three or $400 for a headline because you had to go to companies that made headlines. And you had people called typesetters who were very, very, very technical. And they would look at something that came out of desktop publishing and they'd say, there's too many widows and orphans and the kerning's wrong and how can someone look at it? Well, it cost 10 cents to make, not $500. So people got used to looking at it very quickly. And then it became the way that you did things. And uh, now there's a whole bunch of people that have in their basements these pieces of equipment that cost mm -hmm. three quarters of a million dollars. And the people who did it don't do it anymore in any way, shape or form. And I believe that in advertising, it's pretty much the same thing. I mean, I'm like you. I have a, a, a big budget for creative people. But um, uh, I don't believe it's heresy to believe that there'll be creative people that'll be perfectly suitable for the task at hand that you won't have to pay three quarters of a million dollars to. And that's coming quickly. And it won't necessarily be because they're not wildly creative. They're just not creative in the right way. Uh, and uh, I agree totally with, with what you're saying about how you, you're going to be putting some of these things together. But I think that some of the things that you put together will actually be different things. Mm -hmm. They won't be an advertising yeah, agency. Yeah, it won't be yeah. advertising agency-like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it will reach consumers and cause consumers to do the things that we were previously tasked to do. Yeah. So, so the companies that are providing that service obviously have to be different companies. I mean, mm -hmm. the, was the, the, the rallying cry you always hear is getting rid of the silos mm -hmm. um, and being more flexible, and we've already touched on that. Although um, uh, silos used to be called specialist departments, didn't they? And they were a good thing then. Mm. Um, but uh, I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, the, I mean, the demands from clients are the things that are forcing the hand of agencies to change this. Well, we used you to, have to sorry, I haven't gone, gone yet. <laughs> but hold on a second. When we were silos, we used to have these things called account people that were incredibly valuable and really well trained right, and all course. that kind of stuff. And we kind of yep. blew that off. Right. You know, clients stopped paying for it. We stopped training for them and all that kind of stuff. So the silos end up being exaggerations of a problem, which is that there isn't anybody who really takes responsibility exactly. for the client's business. Right. And that, you know, the holding company was supposed to do that, but the holding company can't really do that because then they got conflict situations all mm -hmm. over the place. You know, the creative agency continues to have sort of that legacy relationship, but 
shouldn't necessarily because they've got a bunch of other silos that they don't actually control the finances of. It's a little bit of a mess. But I don't agree with that at all. Um, good. Let's bring it up. I don't. I mean, I just think you're crazy. I think that a good account people are more valuable than ever. And a really good account person knows how to deal. You know, they're more like a Hollywood producer than they were an account executive because they have to deal. You know, a Hollywood producer yep. has music people, writers, actors, yep. blah, 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 10 different people to deal with. That's what a good account person does today. It has PR, has digital, has creative, it still has promotions, has shopper marketing, has all this stuff that account guys never had, in the, account people had in the past. Really good ones today are invaluable and will become even more valuable because it's not not going to change. You're still going to have to come and have one person who drives the business for the agency, however that agency is configured, and it will be configured differently going forward. But, but finding them is hard. Yeah, finding them is almost harder than finding good creative people these well, days. Well, because it's a stupid, I mean, I'm a lifelong account person. I mean, yeah. you know, you see, I mean, it's a stupid job on one level exactly. unless you do it well, and then it's not a stupid yeah. job. Then it's an incredibly fulfilling job because exactly you're actually right. the one driving the bus. Exactly right. But the good news is if we get thrown out of these jobs, we still got a job, right? Because it's yeah. hard to find people like us. Yeah. yeah. But didn't you? But there is a truth. Didn't you no, there's a truth. With me violently by agreeing with me, I was <laughs> no. saying. That. You said account people need to really blow them off. I don't think we've blown them off. I think we've made. I think what we've done is they've changed. Their roles have changed so dramatically. Yeah, but it's been hard to find. I mean, when yeah. I was in Cannes, I was meeting a lot of creative guys, telling me where have all the great account guys gone? But they've so there's a real always, sense of that. They've been complaining now, they about that guys. since I was That's 12. Different yeah. No, no, <laughs> they hate the account guys. That's different. Finding them, them, yeah. finding them to hate I do, is a different I do. thing. They're I trying to find stupid <laughs> creative people. Marita, you had something to say on this before. Go, go. Uh, I don't, you know, um, I don't come from the advertising business, and I actually, I think the account function is a half function the way it is in the advertising business. I think, you know, a lot of the account folks, yes, I agree that they have to kind of shepherd all of these different um, skill sets and disciplines together um, uh, across multi, multi channel, but they also need to solve business problems for our clients um, much more than they do today. And it's honestly, um, to make it even rarer, if it's rare to find a good account person to go across channel, it's even rarer to find an account person who actually can understand the client's business and marry this very uh, dynamic uh, space with the, the marketing problems that these, these people are trying to solve. It's very complex. And um, you know, in our business, uh, I always say we, recre we create ourselves and our talent every 18 months. Um, and we don't actually just have creatives. We have creative technologists. We have strategic creatives. We have, uh, you know, we have people that have a kind of like a primary discipline and a lot of secondary disciplines that come along with it. And sometimes we really argue, quite honestly, about are they in the creative group? Are they in the technology group? Are they in the strategy group? And that is going to evolve more and more um, to the point where I kind of believe titles will go away and it's going to be skill set based. And you're going to be doing different things all the time. And that that is even going to kind of rock the boat much more because people like to know who I'm talking to on the other side right. and that's going to be complicated. Yeah. Yeah, and what about uh, moving on then, looking perhaps slightly more externally to relations with clients, with financial or otherwise, are those, are those kind of relationships something that has to shift? I mean, even looking at uh, the way agencies are paid for the work that they do, is that something that, well, I mean, it's a, an ongoing ancient debate, but is, a, has this crisis perhaps um, accelerated um, the need for, for those relationships to change? In, and in what way? Matt, you're nodding. Yeah, I'm nodding. I'll I mean, I, I get so bored with us talking about how there's a need for a change and how yes, we get no. paid. And then, well, my apologies know. for bringing that up. No, no, no I don't, <laughs> I'm not bored with you. <laughs> no, but I mean, yes. as an industry, I'm bored with us saying it needs to change and we've got to get more value-based and then we keep getting paid exactly the same, same way, way because we don't really have the yeah. courage of our convictions. I do think that the crisis meant that we were more aware of our clients' business. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that they were trying to pay us less because they were evil. It was because their margins are going down, our margins go down necessarily with it, which hopefully means there's a better correlation between our business and theirs, so that there's more of a skin in the game, which gets to, you remember 20 something years ago when Proctor was trying to do the incentive based on their business and all agencies said, well, we can't actually play that way because we only handle a portion of your right. marketing spends. We can't be held responsible for what happens in store. I think that we have to take responsibility for our clients' business, and we have to be willing to be paid based on their performance, not just ours. And you know, we, we dabble with that, but we're fortunate to have Coke, um, who is sort of blazing the trail for what value-based comp is about. And it's a really healthy dialogue. It's a much richer relationship because we really are in each other's businesses. I also think, lastly, that 
procurement gets a really horrible name, and mm. procurement does not always appreciate the, the qualitative bits that we do. But I think that procurement asks um, to understand our business better than some of our other clients who know us better. Do you really think I that's really going to help? You I really do. Think that's I have, I have help seen you in it procurement help. going forward. It has. It has absolutely helped. <laughs> I'm kidding. Because yeah. it requires that you actually <laughs> deliver on what value is. Yeah, I, I yeah. think that we're we're not. Matt in Siler the, likes procurement. Yeah. I, I think that <laughs> yeah. nobody write that. Yeah, that's I, a very yeah. have. This is not the first time I've said. Yeah. I think in no Secret way love. are we prepared in the, in our small advertising business to actually be a great partner to to clients in a way that can benefit us financially currently. I mean, I had a big brother. I have a big brother. He's five years older than me. And uh, the way that uh, he used to always treat our candy, I'd have a bag of M&Ms, he'd have a bag of M&Ms. He'd say, pour them all in the middle and you'll get more. <laughs> and, and I never got more. And in and the you, very and same way. And you believe them every time. I have it's clients brother, that shall remain much. nameless that I've been on incentive programs with. <laughs> And uh, funny thing, when we meet the number, the rules change, and we don't get the incentive income that we've agreed on. And the reason that we don't is because we've got no s ability to enforce, right? They have the ability to say, do you want to lose the account? And they can open the door, and there's 17 of you guys in the lobby waiting to take their business. And as long as, uh, as, as we are willing to do that, I mean, we fight in our networks, right? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we compete to the death every day with people who we're supposed to be partners with. And as long as that's going to be true, it's going to be impossible for us to get into a relationship in terms of value. I mean, talk about feeding frenzy. Your client, Coke, was in the lobby a second ago. How long was the line? I was in it. All right, so the fact of the matter is, is that I, I truly believe that from a compensation standpoint, right now we're screwed, right? And the next time that we get something that they can't get anywhere else, mm -hmm. you know, that's when we start yeah. Yeah. I mean, putting the it up the other way. I mean, the truth is good clients pay you well, bad clients don't. Uh, you're either valuable. I mean, this argument is so, to me, so ridiculous about your point about we're not paid enough. People pay you what they see your value. You're either valuable to your clients or you're not. Right. And they'll pay you if you're valuable. So make yourself valuable is my answer to that question, which is, is make yourself valuable and people will pay you. The other thing we suck at, which we need to get better at, is writing the, your contract thing up front. We're, we, we, I, I've, I think it's a symptom. Of, we win a pitch before we get the contract done. Then we win the pitch, and then we get a crummy contract, and we bitch about it. Mm. Sit down in the beginning mm. and say, mm -hmm. this is how much we're paid. This is how we like to get paid. This is, we believe we should, we want to be a part of your business, have some skin in the game. We want an incentive. This is the contract. We expect you to deliver on it. If they don't, you got to have the guts to walk. But that's our, we're, it's our own problem. We sit there and we say, well, we'll put incentives, and then when they don't pay them, we go, oh, they didn't pay us. Well, decide how you want to live. Yeah, you know what? I mean, right now, if, you, if the clients are reading our second quarter results as an industry, they're saying, so you've got problems, have you? You're down, what, one or two margin points each of you? Did anybody send any money? Is that a, hmm? Did anybody send any money? <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, we can't sit here having a conversation about this, complaining about that. I mean, I'm with you, Tom. We can't sit here complaining about it because we're not in a crisis on our profits as an industry. And so clients sit there and say, so why are you complaining? And then you've got the whole conversation on the wrong part of the, right. the piece. Right. Because you've got car companies losing everything and being rescued by the government. You've got banks losing everything and being rescued by the government. You haven't got ad agencies yet being rescued by the government. I guess, Matt, your lot are probably in the middle there, no? Not oh, yet? No, no, okay. Oh. Um, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, don't believe everything you read. No, I'm just trying to help Tom pile on you, that's right. But th seriously, if. We've got to get efficient because we waste money on stuff. We do, uh, and we know, and the, the smart clients help us find that. And the good ones will pay us properly at the end of it. And if we're not in that position and we're not really performing, we won't get paid properly. There's too many, there's too many people providing, so it does become hard to compete on the money. But if we're sitting and moaning about the money, we're idiots. We should be talking about what we can deliver, what we can add. Because in the end, the client will save, what, 10, 20, 30 percent on an amazing deal he gets from an agency. How much is that of his total marketing spend? It's a rounding error. Right. It's just a great job for the procurement guy to succeed on, so our job has got to be persuade him that the value of what we do is much greater. Mm. And I frankly don't like getting those conversations because I think you lose if you moan. Right. We should be trying to right. mm -hmm. sell what we do. Mm -hmm. 
Interesting. We, we touched on this uh, before and changed the subject slightly with um, the, the shift to digital. Um, again, a perennial conversation. But you pointed out, Tom, quite rightly, that I mean, the, the advertising industry was already going through a, a, a seismic shift, a, a quantum leap, whatever you want to call it, before um, the um, uh, financial industry took the legs away from the economy. I mean, there was already a, a sort of air of crisis, or, you know, Consumers, the people that we're trying to speak to, of migrating away from the media and the places we normally speak to them. What the hell are we going to do about it? Has this, um, but has this crisis um, accelerated that shift? I um, mean, looking at the numbers, it has. Just because online advertising spending hasn't fallen as quickly, so it's it's gained about five percentage points, about fifteen percent of U.S. advertising spending now, and it was it was ten, only ten percent a year ago. Has it accelerated it? We, we, we chatted about this briefly. Yeah, I actually do. It, it has accelerated it. Um, I think uh, marketers feel like they can um, see measurement. Um, it's I would say measurement's a big area to talk about, but um, and everything shouldn't necessarily be based on measurement. Um, but since they can see it and they're starting to look at it more like that, they feel like they can see it. They can see where that dollar goes and so where it gets So is it a matter of as, as money is? Um, become tighter for clients. The the appeal of online has increased because they it's a feel visibility they can now issue. account for uh, see the ROI. And, or yeah, the it's a visibility more. transparency issue. I think it's uh, it's more it's just more transparent. Um, I don't think where I think uh, from a measurement basis, some people really don't know. Uh, you know, um, like everything gets measured differently within you know across the board. TV is measured different than than you know, using Nielsen maybe, then might be measured different than using the digital, all the different digital channels than the retail store. So they get a lot of metrics that kind of come together that quite honestly could be quite meaningless because mm -hmm. it's like an apples and oranges comparison. Um, but with digital, um, they at least across all the different, when you look at display and search and BT and uh, behavioral targeting, um, at least they can make it consistent across that and they can kind of know what it stands for. Right. So I think it's somewhat emotional, somewhat uh, transparency. Um, and I think they can actually say to their CFO and their CEO, if I spend this dollar, I know what I'm going to, I can tell you what I'm going to get in return. That's why I think it's been a lot more aggressive than it has in the past. I, th I think in some ways digital is like a Crispin, and since they're not here, I can talk about them. <laughs> uh, in that, um, you know, a lot of sizzle, you know, and then at the end you start to look at efficacy, you know, did they move the needle? And do you've seen the articles, maybe not, you know, with all those, those things that they were trying to do. And in the very same way, you know, when you look at the real numbers for digital, click through. You know, forget, like, think about search like the guy opening the door. Right, so certainly someone has to walk in the door. So you know, your Google, your Yahoo, your those kinds of people. Search makes sense, but once you get past that, uh, there's a ton of things that we're trying to do uh, in digital that just simply don't really work. You know, um, there's no click through. I mean, the the percentage of people who click through an ad is just ridiculously low. Um, but uh, it's new, and it obviously is the future. There's no two ways about it. And but you know ability, it doesn't work, right? Uh, How do you know it doesn't work? Well, oh, so many parts of it don't work when we do it traditionally. So when right. we use it in the traditional way, See, we've got a web banner, you know. we've got a scratcher. That's what we know, you, right? You know if it works or it doesn't work. Right. But the fact of the matter is, is that there are parts of it that you know should work, like your ability to talk to a channel, which mm -hmm. is very inefficient in, in wider media. You know, so you're going to talk to African Americans. I'm fighting with a client right now. They spend $40 million a year trying to talk to African Americans. You go to a marketplace like Westchester County, and you're trying to pick 2,000 people out of, you know, 300,000 people. It's very hard to do. But on the web, it's very easy to do. But to them, it doesn't feel right, and they don't quite understand it. So it's, it's hard to convince them to say, take that. I can talk to 4.5 million people with an email. I have their email. I know how to talk to them. And it's, very, and it's only going to cost you $20,000 as opposed to this $6 million that you're spending. Very difficult. Right. You know, it's just tough to move it that way. So I think that what's happening in digital is the same thing that's happening within our organizations where we're having to try to figure out how to put it together so that we have the right competencies is very much happening at the clients as well. You know, they just... Quite frankly, you know, you got a 55-year-old client. He didn't learn it in school, you know, and, and he is having a very, very difficult time understanding how to apply it. Right. right. Yes, and I also think <laughs> that um, 
digital isn't an agency or a department anymore. Digital is a part of every single offer that each of us has. So whether you're a promotions agency or a PR firm or an advertising agency or a digitally expert agency, that's your core, everybody has digital, which means that everybody who's interfacing with the client is representing a digital point of view, partly because many of us have now lived a digital world long enough that it's sort of part of who we are. But I think that really helps a lot because the client organization and the agency facing uh, entities are all about digital. So it doesn't have a separate budget so much anymore. Mm -hmm. It's a part of how we communicate. Mm -hmm. It's being written, uh, the whole digital story is being written every day. Yeah. I mean, still, I can't tell you how many clients went, I don't feel that we're digital enough. And yeah. I'll say, I don't think you are either. And they'll say, why? <laughs> what and do I'll we go, both mean? I don't yeah. know. Well, I guess <laughs> we're not digital enough. You know, whatever that means. It's being written as we speak. Mm -hmm. And so there, there's no answer to it. And whether it's going to be, yes, traditional agencies are having to have more digital capabilities and more digital offering. And then is it going to end up being there'll always be traditional agencies and there'll be digital agencies? I don't believe so, but I don't know. Will the digital agencies start doing more traditional stuff? Maybe. Uh, I, don't, I don't know the answer to the question, but at the end of the day, the group, the company that brings their clients to market on all avenues seamlessly with the most efficiency, the most insight, and the most creativity and distinctiveness about the brand wins. So yep. this argument, this conversation that we're having, well, it's the digital agencies win. It's all bullshit. Whoever figures that out and brings their clients to market through all these things is going to be the winner. And that's what's being written today. The, the, the arguments are about, well, it's going to be the digital companies. It's a stupid argument because right. it's not what reality is. The reality is, is there are clients who need to bring their brands to market. Sure. That's, the char that's the job. Figure it out. Sure. And that's what we're all in the middle of, I think. Yeah, we are. I, I mean, that's, that's a very good exposition of it. I won't try to uh, add to that. What I would do is add something different, which is that um, when you, you asked the question about the acceleration of the change, so I totally agree with his point of view, everything's everything, and mm. if you just try and silo it, it's a right. disaster. But if you go back to your question of digital, what's fascinating is that the Asia digital growth is much faster, much more aggressive right. than any of us expected. Right. And than it is in Western Europe or the US. And in fact, I think we're seeing significant slowdown in the digital growth, if that doesn't uh, make a complicated <laughs> statement, in the US and in Western mm. Europe. Uh, but what we're seeing, we're expecting 30, 40% growth in digital in Asia because this small little word digital means a hell of a lot. Right. It's not just uh, web based pieces. Right. I mean, right. Uh, you know, there's more uh, televisions than telephones in China, and there's more mobile than there are telephones. I wanted so to ask, ask how you do we access people in that space and how do you then reach them? And they're the ones with the money. Yeah. So in places like China, India, and all these other places in the world where there's some real development, they're the people with the money. The people have these things. So yeah. it's very easy to find them. All this wasted stuff we grew up with right. goes away there. Mm. And, I, and, and that um, makes me think I would want to ask you specifically about, uh, um, but everyone else can chip in, of course, about uh, the, the international picture. If we lift our heads a bit and look beyond the US, obviously China, um, as incredible potential, the third largest economy in the world with an advertising industry about one-tenth the size of uh, the United States. So um, um, clearly huge amounts of potential. Um, w which companies are going to succeed there? Which types of companies, not specifically which? In, you know, just, just staying with you for a second, Richard. What's your well, I think, uh, I mean, it's always been the case that China and India had potential. When you've got a billion people, you've got potential. And everyone's been talking about this potential since 1980, I think. So there's no surprise, I guess, in that, because it's a simple statistical fact. I think what becomes interesting is that nowadays, all of our clients and most of our industry are actually making profits in China, mm. which wasn't the case when I was living there 10 years ago. Mm. It was not the case. Most of the competitors did not make money, and a lot of clients saw reduced margins. But my clients have higher margins in China than they have outside of China. Right. So there's a clear opportunity mm. in that market from a profitable growth, which is quite exciting right. for people mm. in the current climate. The kind of companies that are going to do well, therefore, the ones who understand it's not just about the billions and, oh my God, it's a big opportunity, let's pile in. It's the people who really understand how to operate in an environment which is quite hostile right. if you're coming in naive. I mean, everyone has had their trousers taken down at some point in China. Right. Right? Pretty much every client, every agency has had something happen to them. You go, holy crap, how did that happen? Right. And that's because we didn't understand, we didn't look, we didn't think. So I think the people who do well are the ones who really understand what it's like to do business in an environment where old friends need old friends, where if you've been around for a generation, you have got traction. 
right. and you really understand about building for the longer term, not just trying to get this quarter done. Right. Um, and that puts a pressure on us because we're stock market driven by the quarter. So, so we have to be quite careful with that. Yeah, yeah, we have to be quite yeah. careful with that. Yeah. 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 I see you you're nodding, Matt, particularly at the... Uh, yeah, well, the I think that we have looked at those markets as <laughs> you know, huge department stores where there was a great opportunity for us to make lots and lots of money. And we probably looked at it with too much of a Western view. Absolutely. And uh, you know, I, I know we have, and we have to really live it as, as China and recognize that there are lots of different Chinas within China mm. rather than you know, an, an, a Western approach. Mm. So that's taken a while. Mm. It isn't just money to be taken by um, the regular means. God, you're wrong again. Oh, jeez. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Am I going to be wrong with you agreeing with me again? I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm, kidding. I'm kidding. No. I mean, the, the, the numbers are there. I mean, you're right, but the, num the, the numbers don't lie. These are monster markets that are going to accelerate much faster than mm -hmm. other markets developed. And they're, gonna, they're already developing at mind-boggling speeds. And you're right, everybody got dollar signs in their eyes. Uh, for the right reasons, and once things settle down, I bet you once things settle down, that's where you'll really see the brick markets accelerate yep. because they're all pissed at us. I mean, when I travel around the world, the markets they they blame us, mm. they blame um, the U.S. for well, you. starting. And you, you in particular, you. it is mostly Tom's fault. By they the way, blame the Americans most. Especially me. They do. Yeah. Um, the, the truth of it is, is there's no shortage of appetite for the global economy. People like it. They they mm -hmm. they're glad that it happened. Mm. We drove, we started it. They love it. No matter mm. where you go in the world, people love being a part of the global economy. They think it's fantastic. You can't shut that spigot off. Nope. What we've done is we've turned it into a drip, and they're pissed about it because they were liking it, and they want to be a part of it. Once we get back to normal, and once we start a flow, which is uh, going to be take longer than people think, then those markets will explode. We're the ones, they were already on the bus. They were already going fast and furious. So I think that's why they're more, uh, they're listening to us more and they're more anxious for the US to get back on track. Because once it happens, that's when they'll really Absolutely. explode. Because they were already there. Yep. We yep. screwed them up. Yep. Well, I, I had a, a, just well. an ancillary <laughs> perspective, which has always interested me traveling around. And that is that, you know, like, it, in my neighborhood in Westchester County, it's always amazing. I've got to, like, fly all over the world and be in newspapers and stuff like that to have my house. And the guy who lives next to me is a plumber. The guy who lives on the other side of me, you know, is a dry cleaner. You know, and so basically what they did was they found something that everyone in the world needed, right? Uh, they put their infrastructure up, and, uh, you know, they're all retired and making a ton of money. And, uh, and I think that in the advertising industry, uh, we've overlooked some markets which, um, you know, for any number of reasons, uh, we're, you know, we don't like. You know, uh, we've overlooked Africa. We've overlooked India and Pakistan. Um, you know, working worldwide with Western Union, I've just been absolutely surprised at the lack of, of advertising infrastructure for markets that are hungry for them. Uh, and mm -hmm. we just haven't done the job. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think part of not having done the job is that there's a fair amount of, um, uh, uh, let's just say for the sake of uh, this, uh, this particular panel, um, sameness uh, to, to advertising and marketing in the management levels. Uh, and so uh, that sameness tends to make the same decisions over and over again, just variations of that same decision, where um, some of these marketplaces uh, could be wonderfully large marketplaces for, for people who see that opportunity and seize it? Yeah, all you have to do is go around the world and see how tuned in people are to, in all those markets to what we do, whether it's digital, everything. They, mm -hmm. are, they have access to everything. They're totally ready. Yep. Well, they need the experience and they need the, the business sure. and stuff, but everybody's ready to go. Yeah, the same thing that happened in China. Funny. Remember, Africa's just huge, vast wasteland. I was born in Casablanca, and the fact of the matter is, is that what what cell phones did was they connected everybody. They've transformed Africa, yeah. and they've got yeah, yeah, you yeah. know they've got two yeah. iterations of cell phones past us. Yeah. And you go out in the bush, and the guy <laughs> reaches into his uh, in jalaba and pulls out the cell phone, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, we've got to be able to yeah. you know leverage that. Well, I think part, one of the drivers is also just the creation of. I'll call it the creation of wealth within those marketplaces too. So like in India, you know, not really having much of a middle class and then more of the creation of a middle class and, and China, the kind of the same thing. Because 
you can't market to people that don't have money either. So, you know, they've been accelerated. I think part of the acceleration has been around um, the uh, consumer having actually more money to spend. And, you know, and, you know, I, I was, when we were working with Best Buy, one of the things they were talking about is when they launched Shanghai, it was like this completely different model because like Best Buy here, they have a lot of vendors within under the same store, whereas there was a lot of electronic stores that was like a vendor that sold that vendor. And then they had pictures, <laughs> which was like, you know, probably not even great pictures, but a picture of the product. And that was like revolutionary for the other electronic stores. So then everybody else started to have pictures. So there's like, it's like the creation of all these things kind of coming together, which is, you know, I would say definitely mobile or wireless has been huge. Um, the consumers, uh, the people in those uh, marketplaces actually having money and, and becoming wealthier and, you know, and then just us bringing some of this, understanding the culture and bringing some of our, the way we actually talk about product to them. And I think that's kind of the combination of all this coming together is, is going to accelerate this a lot. Right. right. One uh, last question. I might uh, try and leave a couple of minutes to get some um, questions from the audience. Um, a lot of what we've spoken about is it's, it's just going to happen anyway. The companies that speak to consumers in the right way, in the right places, are the ones that are going to succeed, the ones that make the right moves in international will succeed. That's well, business people. That's what uh, the market will make happen over time. I mean, we debate how long it is and when, what the right moves are to make in the meantime. But that's all predicated on the assumption that there is fair competition. That we, you know, that agencies can compete, and, and you know, the, and, the, and the best man wins. Are there any? Is there anything about the um, the structure of the advertising agency? And I'm being a bit coy here, but is there anything about the structure of the advertising agency that means um, that it isn't really uh, as competitive as it might be? Are there impediments to this the free market? I'm referring, of course, to the way. Um, um, Bear with me, Richard, with the way agencies are gathered together into large holding companies, for example. I mean, there was a, one example, I won't name names, but an example recently where a, a very large brand was up for review and an agency, they were talking to an agency, it was one of the group that was bidding for it, and they were told not to because of an arrangement the holding company had. It happens in Formula One, it's going to happen in advertising, don't you reckon? Yeah. Um, <laughs> does, 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 just one example. Do impediments to, to competition like that mean that um, will that will that delay or even stop the, the um, beneficial results of competition? I don't think any advertising pitch is ever a flat pitch. I don't think it is ever truly fair, and I think it would be completely naive and foolish of us to assume it is. Right. Every pitch I go into, I only really go into pitches I think I've got a good chance of winning. Otherwise, what's the point? Right. If I was chosen off the back of a cornflakes packet, it's not very interesting to, to turn up. So I think uh, I'm hoping that the uh, unlevel playing field continues, because otherwise uh, I don't see how we're going to win. Because right. you have to have advantages. Who do you have a relationship with? Who do you know? What do you know? What, do you have a guy who knows that category better than someone else? Do you have an expertise that's better? Why do we buy Razorfish? Because we want to be the so best at digital. You know, you, these are the sorts of things you have to do, I reckon. So I, I'm, the holding company thing, I think it's a bit of a red herring, actually, mm. because um, I know that within the holding company, um, we smile very politely around the table, <laughs> and then we will probably be pretty competitive behind right. it. Okay, right. it's like a family. You are very nice to your brother, but you might not always agree with him. Right. Okay, it's like how it works. So I don't think that's a problem, and I get more beneficiary from Maurice Levy helping me than I do from right. uh, having to do it on my own. So I'm up for that. Right, right, benefits. I mean, I hope it doesn't change until I quit, since I work at a big <laughs> company with a big holding company. So quite like it. Um, <laughs> I mean, my, <laughs> I compete more with the people in my holding company than I compete with people outside of my holding company. And it's yep. as intense as it right. would be, yep. you know, BBDO and DDB and Goodby and those guys are brutal, I mean, to compete against them. I see them every day, um, as well as all the other companies out mm -hmm. there. I think your question, if I'm reading it right, is, you know, back in the 70s and 80s when there was Ali Gargano and Shia Day and um, Fal McGillicott, there were all these really cool medium-sized uh, creative agencies that did killer work that really is who broke down the big agencies. And all of a sudden in the middle of that came uh, the Saatchi's and this right. whole holding company strategy, which right in the middle of a huge creative explosion came the holding companies. And they kind of sucked the life out of that because even the Fallons and the Shiats and the um, McC Scally McCabe sold. 
you know, they sold because the money was too great. And then, you know, some guy came to you and said, I'm going to pay you 10 times earning, you know, I'm going to pay you 10 times and I'm going to give you a contract for five years. You'd have to be a fool not to hmm. sell it. So the question is, I guess I would argue is, is, does that environment exist where you could have breakouts, where you could actually have a legitimate breakout agency that could compete against these holding companies? I think it's tough, but I'm shocked that in this digital environment it hasn't happened, to mm. be honest with you, mm. because if ever there was a time yeah, sure. to break it out, right. it's now, and I'm kind of shocked no one's either had the guts to do it, or right. maybe the math's just too hard that you can't pull it off, but it's kind of a shame, because that's, you like that, I, I always right. thought that was a, one of the great flavors of the uh, ad industry, but. I think it's hard because of the relationships. Because it's, you know, you look at the holding companies, and I agree, it's kind of this unfair disadvantage sometimes. And I actually, sometimes we do pitch, our, our agency does pitch against the traditional, the quote unquote traditional agency sometimes. And it's the relationships that are really hard. The advertisers, if we remember the market, they're confused. There's all this stuff going on. And the one thing that they hang on to more than anything is that relationship. And it's really hard to extricate that away and get that real breakout. And I would say Crispin was probably, you know, the, probably the one that's kind of probably been able to do it the best. But even then, it's, you know, that's been what... But aren't you surprised you haven't seen more of them? I, I, you know, it's, I just, I know when you go up at the senior levels, it's really hard to, to develop those relationships. And I think between, you get those holding companies together. And, you, and, you know, I, I will say, like, hands off to the traditional agencies. They're masterful to relationship development. Yeah, but it's also I, never been expensive to start an ad agency. So the digital... <laughs> The cost efficiency of digital, your point about how easy it is, it's absolutely true, but it's not a huge differential to starting an ad agency in the traditional way. I, I think. feel like they're the ones, Chris, when I like to look at them, I think they're fun. I mean, they are, they're the, in my mind, the best example of somebody who's combined everything. You know, mm -hmm. they're kind of doing a lot of it. I mm -hmm. don't know where they source it all, but they tend to bring their brands to market on multiple levels mm -hmm. as well, if not better than anybody else out there. To me, I haven't seen that enough of that, I guess. Well, I think agencies know. are catching up, and a lot of more agencies mm -hmm. are doing that stuff. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I believe that, um, that there's a fundamental flaw in the, in the structure of most of the holding companies. Um, I think that a holding company in and of itself is agnostic. And the fact of the matter is, is that you could even birth some of these Crispins within a holding company if they were properly set. I think the problem is, and when you were saying some of those names, the Ali Gargano, certainly the Leo Burnett, says that those guys are gone. You know, there's a part in the Bible that says that uh, there came a time when the Joseph generation was dead, right? And I think that in the uh, advertising uh, world, when you look at the top of these networks, and, you know, and Maurice owns my company, and, and I love publicists, but the fact of the matter is they're not ad guys, and Sachi's not an ad guy. And the fact that they're not ad guys means everything. You can't talk ad stuff to them oh, no. because they're not ad guys. You can give Maurice a call. I'll give you a cell phone number. He talks ads, oh. lots. Clients, I talk, ads, uh, lots. well, you know, and again, you know, not, not talking out of school, but uh, I hold that point. And I know Maurice well. And um, they're ad guys after a manner. But um, they couldn't birth a Crispin, you know, because um, there's, a certain, there's a certain ad people were just ad people more than they were anything else. But they else. all sold. You know? I they mean, all that, sold. That's the truth of it's it the is they all sold. They all sold. And what the holding companies, you can't blame the holding companies, what they offer big global clients is efficiencies and scale and things that. And math. But it math. certainly changed the nature of our industry, and that's what we're left with is because um, it was a different world. You know, before the holding companies came, um, uh, the, you, know, you had big global networks. Right, that mm -hmm. were sure. Ogilvy and Mather was run by a guy right. named David Ogilvy, yeah, who was a creative guy, guy right? And he ran a big global network. Mm -hmm. They sold. So, you know, you want to be public, you want to live by the, you live in a glass house, you live with the results. Okay. And it's money, and that's just a fact. So, how do we get around it? And Matt, you've been diplomatically silent on this. Wasn't I just? I know, I was just observing <laughs> that about myself. <laughs> he, he wanted to be last was, so he couldn't be wrong. I was thinking it was one o'clock. I haven't really said anything, but I'm laying in the to. cut for the last word. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it does, it does mean you get the last word. And unfortunately, I haven't left enough time for uh, questions from uh, the audience. So, but you, if you wanted to chip in on that. Uh, I, I would just point, say that, that large point um, um, the fact that we're all publicly held, I mean, our clients are publicly held, we're publicly held, certainly takes some of the freedom that we 
all used to enjoy sure. when we were private. But I don't think that this is a bad thing. I think that there is a huge advantage that each of us enjoys with the holding companies of which we are a part. And I also think that it has helped us understand that we are truly in a business and that it is our clients' results that matter most. Mm -hmm. And in some of the heyday when it was you know, pure creative for creative sake, I'm not sure that there was as much of a relationship between... It's more fun. It was, it was <laughs> sure. more fun, but it wasn't necessarily driving a bottom line. No, it was rehab. Understood. Um, <laughs> so I'm under strict instructions to finish at uh, 1 o'clock, and it's now 1 o'clock, so my apologies for not leaving time for questions. But uh, I want to thank the panel. It was a great discussion. Thanks for taking the time out guys.